जाना
All right. Good morning, Oikos Church. We want to welcome you this morning. Those of you who are online and for those of you here in person, we wish you well. We hope that the Lord is preparing your hearts and your home for worship this morning. And so as we gather together in this space, it's a time to really take account of what we are thankful for. There's so much today to be thankful for, for the weather outside, for the family that surrounds you, for the fact that we get to be here together as followers of Jesus. He loves us, he's with us, and he wants us to be together to encourage and lift each other up. And so as you go about your week this week, we just pray that the Lord is present and that you have opportunities to speak in the lives of those families that you touch, and may they see you with a thankful heart. And so as we worship together, we again want to welcome you to Oikos. and welcome. I'm so glad to see you here today and for all of you online. Thank you for joining us. If you will stand with me, let's, let's just celebrate and praise God today in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I was there.
opposite of hell. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future, my eyes are open. Cause when you called my name, I ran out of that grave.
Go ahead and have a seat. So as we join together as a family this morning, sometimes forgiveness is the one thing that we need to hold on to. And um, if you are like me, it depends on how your week was. So for those of you who are online, you may have decided, "Uh, I'm just feeling like I can't even be here today. But the Lord prompted you to turn on your computer and listen to his word. And in that word, you always hear his precious whisper of, I'm with you. I love the song that you chose, Kelsey, Protector. He watches over our hearts. And I listened to something this morning about how easily our culture can be offended. And that we quickly pick that up and let it be a part of us instead of hearing the call of God, of Jesus speaking to our hearts saying, forgive. And so as people of God, perhaps this week you've had different things go on. Anyone had a a busy week? Was it super awesome? So we had, so even in super awesome weeks, there can be things that you go, I need forgiveness, or the precious forgiveness of God needs to come through me. And I love when someone has a super awesome week, it seems like forgiveness can go, right? It's when you didn't have a great week. That maybe you say, I would rather pick up the offense than let the forgiveness flow through. So this morning, I want us to reflect. Take a moment. Think about those things. I'll tell you for my week, this wasn't an awesome week. It was a week like this. It was really, really awesome, and then it was not so awesome. And if you can relate with me on that, you can go, do I pick up this? Or I look to him and say, let it be. And let the forgiveness flow back out from me. And as a family, I want us to commit to that. When someone says, you've hurt me, let your forgiveness flow. When someone says, I had a super awesome week. Rejoice with them. Because God has done something awesome in their week. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that in our inconsistency, you are constant. Thank you for sending your son to bring atonement and forgiveness into this world that is so quickly ready to take offense. For the things that we've done to those who don't even know we've done something, work on our hearts. For the things we've done intentionally, but we're reluctant to ask for forgiveness work on our hearts for the things we don't even know we've done remind us that your forgiveness is always present and help us work out our lives in a rhythm of repentance and belief No matter what the circumstances are around us, Lord, you have assured us in the word that you are there. Remind us that you're protecting us. Remind us that you're shielding us. Remind us when enemies, it seem like, are all around, you are there. Help us to rest in that. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So whatever you brought into this place today, know that it cannot overcome the one who is here.
no matter what offense you have, no matter what you are dragging along, Jesus has said, I'm bigger than that. And so by the power of Jesus Christ, as a called and ordained servant of the word, I forgive you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So we're coming up on the holiday season. And obviously things are going to look a little different this year for a lot of people. It's going to be like the rest of this year, probably a little challenging. There's a lot of things that we can't do this year. And it might make things seem a little hopeless. This week, we're talking about the resurrection. And the resurrection is a reminder that even in the darkest times, when Christ died and when he was buried in the grave, and his disciples thought that it was all over, that hope was lost, Jesus came back. He kept his promise and he rose from the dead. So this week, we're singing Because He Lives, because this is a reminder that when things are hard and we face challenges and trials, we can still face tomorrow. We can have no fear and put our trust in God, because He has a plan, and He's redeemed us, and we can trust in Him. So if you'll stand with me, let's sing Because He Lives.
How's everybody doing today? A little, little echoey there. Um, woo, we got a group today. I'm sure all these kids are really sad that they're not going to be here to witness the last Sunday out of the book of Mark, but you guys can stay put for it. <laughs> let's, uh, let's raise our hands, bless these kids. Father, these are your children. Thank you for them. Grant them your spirit. Teach them to know your ways and be with them as they learn from you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. It's somewhat anticlimactic. That was the last time we're going to hear that Mark intro. I mean, it feels like we've been in Mark for like years, right? I mean, the, the shortest gospel uh, in the New Testament, and yet we spent a long time on it. I'm, I'm excited to see what happens with Luke as we transfer into that, transition to that next, right? A little longer. Um, I'm so excited for today for a number of reasons. And you're going to get to see how they play out through the morning. But partly because, um, as I've said before in preaching through this series, Mark for me is one that I've probably, probably have spent the most time in as of the Gospels, um, have, have just really enjoyed studying it again for this sermon series. And I think in so many ways, it is, it is a message, I mean, it's a message of hope, it's the good news of Jesus, yeah, blah, 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 right? I mean, I don't want her to play that. But, but Mark, Mark does it in a way which is unique. And this week, in, in the last several weeks, knowing that I was going to have the conclusion, the finale, if you were, there's an aspect of how Mark works, which you may or may not have noticed. And so I'm going to, I was debating if I should do this or not, but I'm going to geek out a little bit on this, okay? Because, because if you look in your scriptures, Mark 16, 1 through 8, and then at the end of verse 8, there will be writings, Virginia's got her Bible open, if you looked, like, or even on, on your Bible app, it would say then that, that some, the oldest manuscripts have Mark concluding at verse 8. But then there's a shorter ending, like a little bit added. There's a longer ending, verses 9 through 20. And so therein lies the debate. And you're thinking, wait a minute, Pastor. There's a debate about where Mark ends? Well, yes. <laughs> and if you're online you're, and you're watching and, and looking at this, and maybe you're kind of checking into the sermon series Mark for the first time, it is. And, and this isn't something to like, like cause um, doubts or worry or concern. But in fact, it's an invitation to say, why do we believe what we believe? It's an invitation for us to say, okay, uh, and I think to be fair, in faith, now the kids are off learning, but why do you, why are you gathered here? Why do you confess to be a Christian? Is it because someone told you so? I mean, I, I don't know what your history is. Would love to, to hear more about it um, because I can talk in my life about some some interactions or periods of time where it's like, whoa, why, why do I believe this to be true? Because there's no proof, right? I mean, he, herein lies, this is just life, right? <laughs> I'm not sure what anybody um, subscribes to, if that's the right word, about how we make decisions in life, but there's no proof. There's no proof whether you're a humanist, an evolutionist, a Christian, Buddhist, whatever it is. Really, there, it's hard to prove whatever place you find yourself in. And more often than not, we are obviously a product of our history, right? We had parents that probably showed us good or bad and modeled for us, good or bad. We accepted, rejected, whatever it is. And Mark is the gospel for me that, that I think, and, and I would love and welcome the conversation, what the manuscript evidence shows us is that it ends at verse 8. And what I say by that is that if, if it actually went through verse 20 from the very beginning as Mark penned it, why would you ever take it out, right? I and mean, this is kind of just as you think about, you know, going back and studying the, the manuscript evidence for the scriptures, why would you ever take it out? But in many cases, you know, we can see later on that there was an effort, well-intended people to, to harmonize and, and to bring things together and say, no, Jesus appeared to many different people. So let's appreciate today for where Mark ends and how it ends for what it does within the context of how Mark told the story of Jesus. Because it's, it's incredibly consistent here in chapter 16. I use that not as a distraction. So please, 
I've invited you to open your scriptures, start reading, which is a great thing. Um, but I, I think it's important to mention, this is one of the rich, the rich aspects of studying Mark's gospel that, that I think we miss. So let's go ahead and just read through um, Mark chapter 16, beginning at verse 1. Now remember, going back last week, um, we were at the, at the crucifixion and the burial, right? And, and the body was taken and laid in the tomb. So, so here we are, the next verse, 16 verse 1. Saturday evening, when the Sabbath ended, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome went out and purchased burial spices so they could anoint Jesus' body. Very early on Sunday morning, just at sunrise, they went to the tomb. Now let's just stop there. Very early, I mean, just at sunrise. So think about Easter, right? Sunrise services. So we've already, I mean, I, I'm one of these guys. I'm not sure if you're a night person or a morning person. I, I'm a morning person. I love being up early, and if I can be up and watch the sunrise, oh, spectacular. So, so don't picture this like, it's like, you know, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock in the morning, and they're, they've kind of taken their time. No, it says, very early on Sunday morning, just at sunrise, they went to the tomb, so picture it as like the sun is just starting to come up, and there the, the, these, these folks, these ladies are, are walking to the tomb to anoint the body, expecting it to still be there. Very early. I mean, there's a wonderful invitation here for those of us who follow Jesus to, to remind ourselves of this every morning, every day. I don't think it's a mistake that our Lord rose prior to sunrise. I don't think it's a mistake that our God creates things day and night in an organized sort of way, and it's been that way from the very beginning. There is a pattern, there is an organization here, and we as those who call Jesus our Savior are able to recognize this every morning. It's a new start. You are reminded that, that you are again a child of God. Don't miss that fact here in this narrative. Verse 3. On the way, they were asking each other, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? But as they arrived, they looked up and saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled aside. When they entered the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a robe, a white robe, sitting on the right side. Now let's stop here for a minute. They saw a young man clothed in a white robe sitting on the side. As Mark describes this, again, very consistent. Who has Jesus been through the, the context of this gospel? The Son of Man. Every sort of day, Jesus of Nazareth and kind of very mundane, typical, every door sort of ways. And here is Mark describing this angel as just a young man. They walk in and notice just a young man, quite ordinary. And yet, Jesus in the gospel has been God among the people but just a man for so many to see and follow and be with, but doing miraculous kingdom of God things. And so here is Mark wraps us up. Verse 5, when they entered the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a white robe sitting on the right side. The women were shocked, but the angel said, don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead. Look, this is where they laid his body. Now go and tell his disciples, including Peter, that Jesus is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there, just as he told you before he died. The women fled from the tomb, trembling and bewildered, and they said nothing to anyone because they were too frightened. End of story. <laughs> does, I mean, does that strike you as an interesting ending for all the things that we've We've, you know, your history of studying the scriptures, and, and so, so the women the next morning, they go, they're, they're thinking about doing this, they've got spices to go with the body, what are we going to do? It's sunrise, oh, but the, I mean, it's a, it's, there's a big stone, what, oh wait, the stone's gone? They walk in, there's a young, an angel sitting there, don't be frightened, Jesus is cru the crucified one, the Jesus of Nazareth, he's been raised from the dead. Now go on and tell the others, and Peter, that he'll meet you in Galilee just like he told you. And the natural reaction the women are frightened and go, don't go tell anybody. End of story. From Mark's gospel, end of story. So what do we do with this? I mean, what do we do with this? What was Mark intending to do with this? Are we missing something 
from all the other gospels that have Jesus showing up and hanging out with the disciples afterwards and eating with them and showing them and you know Thomas I, unless I see unless I see him I can't believe well here touch my side see my hand oh okay I believe now is, is somehow Mark's gospel deficient because this is where it ends like, somehow the Gospels that include those other aspects are more complete. They are better to support the faith. Would any of you recommend Mark to that new person asking about the faith? I've got one for you. Go read Mark's Gospel and let me know how, how you feel about it once you get to the end. Is there a reason for us to somehow question who Jesus is based on this ending? Now let's let it play out a little more, obviously. So as Mark tells us, the women show up, the stone is, is gone, there's an angel, the body is gone, and they flip out. <laughs> I think that's a pretty natural reaction, right? 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 I mean, they took spices. They were going to anoint the body. The idea of, of, even though Jesus told them, the idea that Jesus' body would not be there was nowhere in the realm of possibility. I mean, if they're thinking, how can we get the stone rolled away to get in? Obviously, the dead body that was laid behind it is going to be stuck there, right? <laughs> it's just... So what happened? Well, obviously, the women didn't keep it to themselves. Right? We start kind of playing some of these things out. I think that there is, there is an invitation with this ending of Mark's gospel for us to probably stop. And instead of rushing on to the other, what the other gospels would have, is to just stop here. Okay, so if, if Mark ended here, I mean, the, the end of it is, for they were afraid. The last words of Mark's gospel is because they were overwhelmed with fear. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Now picture yourself, right? Because this wasn't like written as a narration as it was occurring, right? Jesus is crucified, is raised from the dead shows himself to many of, of his followers, ascends to be with the Father. The day of Pentecost happens, and then over time, the church is like, well, okay, is tomorrow? Wait, sunrise tomorrow, We're gonna, he's going to be back tomorrow. Nope, nope, I mean tomorrow. Nope, nope, tomorrow. And eventually, as the word of who Jesus is needs to be spread, then we start to have these things written down. I mean, it's already been, trust me, it's being shared verbally immediately. Well, after the women stop being afraid. <laughs> immediately thereafter, because this is an oral tradition we're dealing in, right? I mean, go back and think about what, what the scriptures would have entailed at the time of Jesus' own ministry. It would have only have been the Old Testament, right? The holy, the holy writings of the nation of Israel. And those would have been precious few copies that would have been kept in the houses of worship. And the people who were trained to read would read them, and they would share them with the people. But it was an oral tradition. Everyone that grew up would have known this as their family story, and they would have been able to tell their children and their children's children and sitting around with grandpa and grandpa. I mean, just picture it. Picture it. This, this would have been the way it would have worked. So as soon as this stuff starts happening, you know, all of... Remember, all of the disciples now have gone away, right? Everybody left in Mark's gospel. Everybody left. And it, we're told here at the end, the women discovered the empty tomb and they're afraid. So the word spreads. And it probably spreads pretty quickly among certain pockets of people. And ultimately, then Mark, in this case, writes down, pins his oyangelion, his version of the good news, the gospel, the good news, according to Mark. And that gets shared, and it becomes one of these, these precious writings that conveys the faith. We, we take it for granted, folks, that we can sit here and I can have the whole thing on my phone. And not just the whole Bible, but like, I don't know, 40 different versions of it. 
right? I mean, it's, it's crazy. So let's go back a little bit and just, again, trying to, trying to take these last eight verses of Mark and, and try to go back and see what is Mark doing here in the rest of his gospel, because this really does complete the picture for us. There's a reason why we've been intentionally walking through this, and maybe too deliberate for some, <laughs> but walking through this, because it's, it's a narration of faith. It's a narration, it's a telling of the good news. Well, I want to go back to verse, verse 6 here, because what we're told is that when the women show up, it, but the angel said, don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He isn't here. He has risen from the dead. Look, there is where they laid his body. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, the crucified one. The language is very specific. What is the angel pointing to? What is the messenger of God pointing to when they discover the empty tomb? He is pointing to the cross. Looking for Jesus, the crucified one, the one who was crucified, is crucified. He's not here because he's rose again, but you're looking for the crucified one. See, from this point forward, Jesus will forever be the crucified one. Forever be the crucified one, the one who was hung upon the cross, who in that act, God saved the entire world. He will forever be the crucified one. You realize when Christ returns, and we get to see him, he will still have the scars. His body, which is raised from the dead, will still have the scars because he is the crucified one. That is his mission, his, the reason why he was incarnate, that's what he was all about, was so that he could be crucified. The resurrection, even though it says that this is valid, this is the, the penalty that God required, the resurrection, as great as it is, his defining act is upon the cross, folks. And this is what the messenger of God identifies. He says, you're looking for the crucified one. He's not here. He's risen again. This message of suffering and crucifixion, this is what Mark is. I want us to stop for a minute because as we studied this, we were moving through chapter 1 and 2. We're moving quickly and we're going, 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 right? I mean, Jesus is public ministry. The, the kingdom of God is here. It's like very quick. There's no birth narrative. It's just like bang, 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 right? And he's going. He's doing kingdom of God stuff and he's moving. He's moving, moving. Miracles, yeah, yeah, all over the place. And then we hit the middle of chapter 8, and it's kind of like, Urch. something happens there in chapter 8. If you recall, I'll invite you to go back and look at it, because Jesus comes across someone who is, is blind. And it takes, it takes Jesus two tries to give him his sight back. Probably the wrong way to put it, two tries. I wouldn't put it that way. It's intentional, because then what happens is that the back end of chapter 8, and this is what we talked about, this discipleship manual, right? From the back end of chapter 8 till chapter 10, as we describe it, that's a whole different section of, of the telling of Jesus' ministry within Mark's gospel. And so I want us to go back to chapter 8. I think it's verse 34. We've got it up here for you to listen to. And this is after, already, Jesus predicts his first time, he predicts his own death, that he will suffer. And then if you recall, uh, Peter says, no, no, Jesus, that could never happen. And, and Jesus says, Peter, get behind me, Satan, right? You have the things of man in mind, not the things of God. And then Jesus says this, then calling the crowd to join his disciples, he said, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must take up your own, you must give up your own way, take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. You are to have the things of God in mind. 
this call to take up your cross and follow Jesus points directly at what Jesus ultimately did. He was found guilty of being a criminal and was crucified. A way of suffering. This isn't the call. I mean, let's see, how can I say this? This isn't the uh, just pray to Jesus and he'll fill up your checking account speech, is it? Or sermon, is it? This isn't the, oh, come on, I know times are tough, but there's a good day coming tomorrow. And that good day tomorrow is going to be like your job coming back. And oh, all those people you know that are sick, they're going to be well. And oh, that promotion you've been asking for, you're going to get it. And oh, you know, it, no. No, Jesus says, pick up your cross, give up your way. Just give up your way. Because I know what your way is. It's not about those things. Give it up. Pick up your cross and follow me. And so what we find here at the end is that Mark is saying, you look for the crucified one. That is the focus of Jesus' ministry. The very reason why he came was to suffer and to die. Pick up your cross. Give up your way and follow me. Those who try to save your own life, it's not going to go too well. But if you give that up and you come with me, yeah, it'll be okay. It'll be okay. And now that we can look from the tomb, the crucified one look back, it's like, oh yeah. That's what he was calling them to do. Just come with me. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be all nice and lovey-dovey. It's not going to be you getting everything you want. It's not going to make you happy. But you know what? It's going to give you life eternal. It is going to bring you into relationship with your Father, the Creator. It's going to give you hope in the midst of suffering. See, it, it's a false hope when you're getting the things that you want. <laughs> it's, it, it, you don't get to take any of it with you. I'm not sure how you want to kind of spin it, right? It, it, it's a false hope. It's things based on what man, what the world says is important. It's not what God says is important. And there is the struggle. Therein is the struggle. So Jesus says, come follow me. Come follow me. It's going to be a lot of suffering. I mean, it's not going to be easy, folks. You're going to fall down, and you're going to have to repent. And you're going to fall down and repent and fall down and repent. But you know what? It's just about a relationship. It's about you being with me. And don't worry, you're going to see how much your Father in Heaven loves you when I hang and die on a cross. That's the message here. All of this is wrapped up in this, oh, you're seeking Jesus of Nazareth, the crucified one. Back to the cross, the one who gave his life for you because your Father in heaven loves you so much that he sacrificed his own son for you. Because that was the only, only way to satisfy what was required. You seek him. He's not here. He's not here. Right? Look, the body's not here. He's not here. Oh, and then we go on from there, right? Verse um, 7. I'm going to bounce around here a little bit. Mark 16, um, verse 7. Now, this is what the angel says. Now, go and tell his disciples, including Peter. Oh, wonderful Peter, right? Who was the one through the gospel? Who was the one through the... No, no, Jesus. No, no, no. This isn't going to happen. You're not going to die. Get behind me, Satan, right? To Peter. And then just Peter kind of keeps on going with this stuff, right? Time and time again. I will never betray you, Right? Nope, Peter, you're going to betray me three times before the, the, the rooster crows, right? Oh, I mean, look at Mark here. Now go tell his disciples, including Peter. Don't forget Peter. He's the one that kept jumping out and saying something. He was saying what everybody else was thinking, what everybody else wanted to say, including Peter, that Jesus is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there, just as he told you before he died. You might say, well, where did that happen? Well, let's go back to Mark 14. What verse is that? I think it's verse 28. Jesus says, but after I am raised from the dead, I will go ahead of you to Galilee and meet you there. 
A nice little package there, isn't it? How those things fit together. Verse 7, now go and tell his disciples, including Peter, that Jesus is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there just as he told you before he died. And the women fled the tomb because they were trembling and bewildered. They didn't know what was going on. They were frightened. See, there is, there is nothing missing in this gospel if you trust and take Jesus at his word. The fullness of what God did in Christ upon the cross is there. And in fact, it's so contained, probably the wrong way to use it, but it, it's, so, it's so focused on Jesus. It's all about Jesus and what Jesus did upon the cross, the crucified one. Now go, tell his disciples and Peter, you know, Peter, he blew it more than the rest of them. Go tell them, he's going to see you. He told you he'd see you in Galilee. Right now, now, obviously, things move forward, and what happened? They saw him in Galilee, right? And, and he appeared, and he was with them for a while before he departed them to go be with his father so that the counselor, so that the helper, so that the spirit could come and rest within the believers. See, Mark's gospel has it all. It has it all in a very... Um, amazing sort of way and and I one of the things I appreciate so much is that Mark doesn't he doesn't have a lot of extra fluff whatever that means I mean he, he kind of gets to the point but even even at the end he stops with where that's all you needed to know the tomb is empty was it because someone stole the body or this or that based on faith you're going to say no the crucified one has risen from the dead and he is going to see you like he promised he would see you. And for those of us that are still here, he's going to see us like he promised he'll see us when he returns. Right? I mean, th this, this is so much hope for those of us who have either grown up in the faith or have been around the church. Because in Mark's gospel, the disciples never get it. Not once. <laughs> Not even like partially, right? You know, who, who was... Even when, when Peter you know, made a confession, it, wasn't, it was wrong, to be honest. You know, Peter's asking for, come do what you're going to do, like, like overthrow Rome so that we can be in charge. And that's, again, the things of man rather than the things of God. The one true confession in all of Mark's gospel is the Roman soldier, as we heard. That was at the cross, the foot of the cross, after Christ gave up his last breath. Truly, this is the Son of God, he says. And so we get to the end of the narrative and there's nobody around. No disciples, no followers. And the folks that came to the tomb have run off because they're freaked out by what they found. <laughs> I, think there's, I think there's some hope for us. I don't know. I think the way Mark leaves it, I don't, I don't believe that those who were gathered there that day have any more proof than we have today about who Jesus claims to be in the invitation we have to believe who he claims to be. I mean, could you see someone with those kinds of scars? And No, he wasn't, wasn't really dead. I mean, you can, you can explain it away. No, nah, no, nah, something else is going on. It still comes back to faith, folks. It still comes back to faith. And this ending of Mark, this gospel, this good news of Jesus, of the crucified one, I mean, maybe we should start using, actually, I think about it, we should start talking that way. I follow the crucified one. That's probably a good reminder. Faith is wrapped up in the cross. When I suffer, I shouldn't be surprised. My Lord didn't pro promise roses and happiness. He promised me suffering and challenge and difficulty for today. Because it's not the end of the story, right? The resurrection, Jesus is just the first fruits of what we all look forward to. And so the one who wrote most of the New Testament, that is Paul, I think gives us something really good to kind of reflect on in chapter 2 of 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2, is that right? I think that's right, yeah. 
Here we go. This is a trustworthy saying. Paul says, if we die with him, we will also live with him. If we endure hardship, we will reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. And if we are unfaithful, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny who he is. I love this. And it actually ties directly to Mark's gospel. If we die with him, he will, we will also live with him. This is, what, this is what Jesus tells us, what Mark tells us. This is the call to come, pick up your cross, deny your way, come with my way, and then be united with the crucified one. If we endure hardship, we will also reign with him. Did he endure hardship? Yes. The worst situation ever that we could never relate to. If we deny him, he will deny us. Well, that's, that's consistent. If we deny and push and say, I don't believe, that's consistent. But yet, if we are unfaithful, he remains faithful. Remember the father? The father from Mark chapter 9? Who's whose son was demon-possessed, and he brought the son to the disciples, and they couldn't do anything about it, so they went to Jesus. And the father's like, Jesus, I brought this, my son, this demon, tosses him in the fire, tries to kill him to your disciples. They couldn't do anything about it. And Jesus says, if you believe, all things are possible. And the father says, I believe, help my unbelief. I believe, help my unbelief. Oh, what an amazing, honest statement about the life of faith. And struggling with, is this stuff real or not? What an honest statement about our experience. I believe that you are the risen Lord, that you are the crucified one who rose again, but I see my family, my loved ones die. I appeal to you for everything, and they still die. No, some are healed, and some, some continue on, but, but there is all kinds of struggle in this life. I believe, help my unbelief. Because as Paul says... If we are unfaithful, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny who he is. So who is he? He is the crucified one. And he is the proof in faith of how much God loves you. He is the one who sent his spirit. And so though you might be unfaithful, you might have all kinds of doubts and weakness because of, of what this body is and that death and the Satan still has his day. But the spirit of God lives in you. The spirit of God is inside of you, whether you know it or not, in faith. And Jesus sees that. That spirit of God is connected with him. And so Christ might come and find you with all kinds of doubts. Maybe more doubts than confidence today. Maybe more unfaith than faith. But your, his spirit is within you. And, and there's, that, there's that unity. There is that connection of Jesus and the spirit saying, yes, you are my son. You are just suffering the way I suffered. Don't be surprised. Don't be dismayed. Don't give up hope. Don't think that I'm not with you. I love this. This, this Second Timothy, what Paul is talking about, is a great connection with us as we follow the crucified one. Are these pieces coming together? Can you tell I'm excited for today's message? <laughs> it's a great message, folks. It's a great message, and I think that it is it is so appropriate to the context we find ourselves in today. And what I mean by that is that there's more struggles and things we probably didn't anticipate a year ago. We are in a different place than anybody thought we'd be in. Uh, what month are we in? Thanksgiving of, of 2019. Right? Right? But there is hope. There's hope in the face of this, in the midst of this. There is hope because we have been called by the crucified one. I'll boil down this whole thing. Here's what I, I think is a good way to think about it for Mark's gospel. I think Mark's gospel is all about the statement that believing is seeing. Believing is seeing. And what I mean by that is you can go back through the gospel of Mark. And did the disciples drop everything and, and go follow Jesus? Yes. Yes. And did they get it right? No. <laughs> right? Because they were following. They were, 
they were seeing miraculous things, but they didn't quite understand or believe or trust who Jesus was going to be as the crucified one. See, they had hope. They had a hope in God's message. They had, they had hope in God's salvation, which they knew would be coming. They had hope in what it would look like, but, but the way they, they packaged it was in the context of the day. It was in the, well, when Jesus comes and he takes over and the Messiah comes, then, well, good, Rome will be out of here and we'll be in charge again. God's people will be in charge again in a very human sort of way. So they were seeing, they were there, they were at his feet. And then, you know, things, they kind of unwound in a few spots. And they doubted a lot. And they didn't quite get it during those sections of, like I mentioned, the middle of Mark's gospel. And Jesus is talking about three times he predicts that he would die. And he calls them to follow him and, and discusses what it means to be a, a disciple. And they don't quite get it. They see it. They're there. I mean, they're at his feet. They see it. But they just don't, they don't quite get it. They aren't there believing what Jesus came to bring. And to be fair, in Mark's gospel, we never see the disciples believe in the way that Jesus brought it to be. We never have the disciples believing in a way so that they see Christ and Jesus for the fullness of who he is. And so ultimately, within the context of Mark's gospel, it boils down to Jesus, the crucified one. That's it. And believing in him, you can see everything else that God does. And you can see in the midst of, of all kinds of suffering and challenge that, no, I'm not alone. <laughs> My Savior struggled more than I did. Certainly more than I did and do and will. And yet Jesus came to bring life and faith and life abundant. <laughs> I'm going to appeal to Paul one more time. Because I think there's another section of where this crucified one comes into play. The crucified one. You seek the crucified one. And this is in, in Romans chapter 6. We've heard this section before. Romans chapter 6. I'm just going to read a couple verses here. This is where, where Paul is talking about baptism. Romans chapter 6 verse 4. Paul says, For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. Do you see what Paul is doing here? We're talking about baptism. We're talking about faith coming. We're talking about the activity and action of God. And in baptism, Paul is uniting this, that we, for we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And so if we die, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the power of the Father, we now live a new life. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ. We were united with the crucified one. How good news is that? In baptism, so this whole thing, right, of Mark's gospel that you seek and you have found the crucified one. Paul is appealing to this. This is exactly what's going on in baptism. He is saying that in baptism, you, your sinful, dead, old self, the old Adam, Adam is crucified with Christ. And what happened with, with Christ? Well, in the crucifixion, they come and they find an empty tomb. That is our life in faith, folks. Yeah, we're still here dealing with this kind of, you know, old, decrepit, challenged body. Some of us are struggling with certain things more than others physically. But we are united with Christ in the crucifixion, in his crucifixion. And so his future is our future, ultimately. Not quite fully yet, but ultimately that's where we're going. And this is why we celebrate baptism. Amen? Amen? Well, you know what? We've got a baptism today. Yeah. I'm excited. This is, I mean, think about how this fits together. Mark's gospel, 
16, right? The empty tomb. The crucified one, Paul, wait. In baptism, we are united with Christ in his crucifixion. So today, we're going to, um, I'm going to, now, we're going to, the way we're going to do this, everybody stay where you are, is that um, we're going to, this is the first one we've had, I think, since the first one in the gathering, since the whole virus impact, right? Um, so we've got Mike and Emily and Jonathan, they're going to come down over this way, and uh, you are going to stay where you are, so you may or may not be able to see them. Sorry, you can turn your chairs around if you want to face this way. Just stay where you are, though. And we have a baptism. So I want to remind us of a few things, right? What is baptism? Well, we just heard what, what Paul said in Romans. But keep in mind that the Lord used water to save Noah and his family, right? The Lord, the, the Lord, the Lord used water to save Israel, as they were coming out of captivity. We should not be surprised that the Lord uses water in amazing ways. Matthew's gospel tells us, Jesus says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples by baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded. And surely I am with you to the very end of the age. And that's what we're doing. We're here to celebrate what the Lord has given through his people, through his family, through the gifts and the amazingness of water. How are we doing today, mom and dad? Good. Yeah? Hey, buddy, how are we, Jonathan? What's up? I know we got some family probably watching online. How are you, buddy? There's a lot going on here, huh? So Jesus and fathers of the church talk about that this is an amazing transfer, if you will right? That, hi buddy, well come on, we came over here. <laughs> that in, in the baptism, that if you will, that in, at this point, um, Satan, right? Sin has its rule on us. And so what occurs in baptism is an amazing transfer, is that we come from being, you now, you know, can Jonathan do this on his own? No. We come from being part of, if you will, sin having a reign in us to becoming part of the kingdom of God. And so we're going to ask, since Jonathan can't answer for himself quite yet, we're going to ask mom and dad to answer for him, since you're the ones that have brought him to this point. Do you reject Satan and all of his works and ways? You can say yes out loud. Yes, yes we, we know you're nodding. And not only do you reject, but what are we for? Do you believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth? Yes, I do. Do you? Do you? Oh, okay, you can respond too. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried, descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. Yes, yes I believe that's a long, I know it's a longer one. <laughs> and do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church? the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting? In that case, who's going to hold the little man here? All right. Here it goes, buddy. It's kind of, it's kind of cold water. I, I touched it earlier. So we're going to see how he does here. So if you could just hold him down over the font. Jonathan Michael Stevens, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. There you go. Oh, look at that cool hairdo. <laughs> Receive the sign of the cross upon your forehead <laughs> and upon your heart. He's like, no, I've had enough of you. <laughs> this is a wonderful, wonderful day. And so, Mom and Dad, here, I'll let you take this. We have a couple things for you. We have a baptismal candle. Right, as we're told, right, that um, in baptism, new life is given. The Spirit of God comes to live within this young man and that he should let his shine like a light upon a hill that all could see his faith, see his good works, and give glory to his Father in heaven. I also want to remind you that you're not in this alone, right? Right, church? You've got a lot of people here with you, those folks that are watching online, that we're in this together, right? Amen? And so 
while you guys have come, and the time will be when, when Jonathan's going to be able to think about what does this mean and how does this work, and you guys, as we've discussed, are going to work in that process with him in your own faith and talk about what that looks like around the supper table, whatever it is, but you're not alone, and the Lord gives you help. The Lord gives you his spirit, but he also gives you his body, his church to come alongside of you, and that's a wonderful, wonderful gift. So I just want you guys, I would encourage you to lean on that as well, Okay. Let's, you can, if you want to, you can blow that out. It's okay. And then we're going to pray. <laughs> All right. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you. We thank you for this gift of baptism. We thank you, Father, that you chose to come in a way in Jesus of Nazareth, the crucified one, to show us what you are all about and that you are a God who is trustworthy, who is faithful, and who we can come to knowing that our lives are in your hands. And so, Father, we just, we pray for Jonathan. We pray for Mike and Emily, for their family, for this church, for your church throughout the world, that the message of the crucified one would continue to be spread wide so that those who are struggling, who are in places of challenge and darkness would have hope. Not that their condition may change, but that in the midst of that, they could have hope that you are their God and that they are your child. And so we commend Jonathan to you, Father. We pray that you would continue to walk with each of us in this time as we struggle with what life is in this context we find ourselves. We pray, Father, that you would help us to celebrate the gifts of faith, such as baptism, as supper, as gathering as God's people, and know that by your spirit you will find us faithful. We pray this in Jesus' name. And Father, we Pray the, the prayer that your son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right. What's next? I'm trying to think. Yeah. Praise God. I think we have more worship, right? Yeah. Let's worship. So this week, for Thanksgiving, we can give thanks that God's love is never ending. And even though we may be apart, we can still sing as a church, as God's people, sing our praises to him. Amen? Amen. All right, let's stand and sing. Strong. 
never ends. And all the people say amen. too many announcements today. Um, it's good to be family. Uh, it's good to be family on mission. And certainly as we think about what that mission looks like, part of that is stewardship and talking about the gifts that the Lord gives us. I'd encourage you, if you have any questions about that, to ask them and we can have a conversation. There's three ways to give. Brown box, online, text. Um, again, though, love to chat with you and talk about it. Um, receive the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.